In this video, we begin our discussion of the inverse of a matrix. The inverse is the last piece in the puzzle of matrix algebra, and it is a truly inspired idea. Now, it will take more than one video to tell you everything you need to know about the inverse. So this video is about the big idea. In subsequent videos, we'll give you an algorithm for calculating the inverse. We'll explain why that algorithm works. We'll talk about some other fascinating properties of the inverse. And we'll also discuss situations where the inverse is not possible and shouldn't even be attempted. So now we're focusing on the big idea. So here it is. Consider this linear system which we're now interpreting as a matrix equation, a known matrix, multiplies an unknown matrix, and that yields a known matrix. And we now know full well what this multiplication means. So what was just notation before, and we were using this notation while we were still using the decomposition perspective, is now much more than notation. It's now the operation of multiplication and we're thinking of these objects as block indivisible elements. So we're taking a much more bird's eye view on what's going on. And when we see this, we actually think AX equals B. Known, unknown, known. Very similar to an ordinary 5X equals 4 type of equation for individual numbers. And now you will notice some space here and here. And that space was left there for a reason. And here is the reason. Now imagine thinking of the system as a matrix equation. We have an identity, and whenever we have an identity, we can multiply both sides of the, of the identity by the same matrix, just like with ordinary numbers. If A equals B, then 10A equals 10B. Well, if this product equals this matrix, then we can multiply both of these sides by the same matrix. We just have to be very careful to multiply on the consistent side. So we'll multiply this matrix on the left and we'll multiply this matrix on the left because the order matters. Of course, we couldn't even possibly multiply it on the right by a three by three matrix because the dimensions would be incompatible. But nevertheless, let's be careful and multiply both sides of this equation by the same matrix on the left, a perfectly valid operation. And what kind of matrix are we looking for? Well, we're looking for a matrix such that this product equals the identity matrix. Number one, why can we even talk about this product? Because first we have this product, and then this product is being multiplied by another matrix. But we have associativity. So whereas in the original setup, this multiplication came first, and then the result was multiplied by another matrix. We can carry out this multiplication first. So we can talk about the value of this matrix, uh, the value of this product, multiplying this matrix of the unknowns. So associativity to the rescue. And as I mentioned before, there's no going forward without associativity, and here is a microcosm Y. Okay, so, what kind of matrix are we looking for here? Well, suppose we could come up with a matrix so that this product is the identity. So that this product is the identity matrix that we have just introduced. Now, when we introduce the identity matrix, you may have thought to yourself that it's the most boring, useless matrix in the world. It's much ado about nothing. There's a lot of calculation only to leave the matrix that it multiplies unchanged. So it's useless. What's the use? Well, it's probably the most useful matrix in the world, and you're about to see why. So if we're able to come up with a matrix so that, so that this product is the identity, think of what we would have on the left-hand side. We would, have, we would have identity times the matrix of the unknowns. And of course, the identity leaves anything it multiplies unchanged. So what we'll have left on the left-hand side is just the vector of the unknowns. And the vector of the unknowns will equal that same magical matrix times the original right-hand side. And then we will have succeeded in solving the equation and our thinking was 100% algebraic. All that would be left to do is to actually carry out this product 
and we would have our answer. So let's now repeat the idea, but this time use letters instead of matrices, so you can see in very short expressions just how inspired and simple this idea is. So we're given this matrix equation, AX equals B, and let's multiply this matrix identity by the same matrix on both sides. And that matrix is the magical matrix. It's denoted by A inverse. And it's a matrix such that A inverse A, such that when it multiplies A on the left, yields the identity matrix. Now the identity matrix is denoted by the capital letter I for obvious reasons. So what we now have is IX equals A inverse B. And IX is of course X because I is the matrix that leaves anything it multiplies completely unchanged. So the result is that X, our matrix whose value we're trying to find equals A inverse B. So, when we, so if we have A inverse, then any linear system, AX equals any right-hand side B, is pretty much solved. All we have to do to determine the matrix of the unknowns is to multiply the right-hand side by A inverse. So the answer is A inverse B. We've seen it before, but before we came up with this expression, simply by analogy with the ordinary equations such as 5x equals 4. Well, now we have the full framework mapped out. And we also mentioned that we prefer A inverse B instead of B over A. Well, that's for lack of commutativity. That's because when you write something over A, it's not clear whether you should evaluate, it, evaluate the numerator first and then divide it by A, or whether you should divide by A and so forth. So the order becomes unclear. So that notation is not suitable for matrix algebra. That's not commutative. So that's why we prefer this notation. And the only question is, what is A inverse? What are the values? What are the entries of A inverse? And more importantly, how do you calculate it? So we'll discuss how to calculate it later. But for now, let's experience A inverse. I calculated it before this video, and I have it on a piece of paper. So let me write in those values, and let's just make sure that it's indeed A inverse, that it's the matrix, such that if it multiplies A on the left, the result is the identity matrix. Okay, and then we will also use that identity matrix to solve the system and actually find the X, Y, and Z for this system, which if you recall are 1, 1, 1 from an earlier video. All right, but the values of A inverse are. So we're multiplying both sides by this equation, by this matrix. So let me also write it on the right-hand side. All right, so two things that are left to do in this video. Number one, to make sure that this product is indeed identity. And number two, once we make sure of that, which means that on the left-hand side we have identity times this matrix, in other words, just that matrix alone, equals this product. So when we evaluate this matrix product, we'll have our solution. That's the beauty and the power of the inverse. All right, let's make sure that this is indeed the identity. All right, let's practice all possible perspective, perspectives on matrix multiplication. First, let's take the column perspective, which is finding linear combinations of these columns with coefficients coming from this matrix. So for the first column, our coefficients are 1, 4, and 7. So let's see what we find, what we get in the first column of the result. So we have negative 2 thirds minus 16 thirds, which is minus 18 thirds, plus 7, which, is, which makes for 20, uh, 21 thirds. So minus 18 thirds plus 21 thirds is 3 thirds, or 1. We're off to a good start. Let's now find what we get in the second entry. We have minus 2 thirds plus 44 thirds. So minus 2 thirds plus 44 thirds is 42 thirds, which is 14. And then minus 14 gives us 0. 
I think this equal sign is a little bit distracting, so equals. All right. And then for the final entry, we have 1 minus 8 plus 7, which is 0. Great. So we're done with the first column, and it is indeed the first column of the identity. Let's now get this entry by itself to illustrate the dot product perspective on matrix multiplication. And this, of course, involves dotting this column with this column, excuse me, with this row. And the answer is doing the running sum 3 minus 9, 1. So we now evaluated this entry by the dot perspective, dot product perspective, and so far we're getting identity. Let's also calculate this entry by the dot perspective. Actually, let's go for this one so we can save more opportunities for the row perspective. Okay, so to get this entry, we need to dot the second column with the last row of the matrix on the left. And we have 2 minus 8, 0. So 0 here. So the identity matrix is showing up uh, quite beautifully. All right, let's now get the first row by the row perspective. So we have to calculate the linear combination of these rows where the coefficients come from the first row of the matrix on the left. So let me sneak in those coefficients right here. So negative two thirds, making for a big mess, negative four thirds, and one. All right, so in the first entry, we will get negative two thirds minus six, 16 thirds plus 21 thirds. We've already done this calculation, and that's one. In the second entry, we would get minus 4 thirds, minus 20 thirds, so that's minus 24 thirds, or minus 8, plus 8 equals 0. And for the final entry, we have minus 2, minus 8, that's minus 10, plus 10, 0. All right, and I will save these two entries, which will, of course, work out for you to figure out. I suggest practicing the row perspective one more time to get the second row. All right, so the result is the identity matrix. And we also took this calculation as an opportunity to practice the different perspectives on matrix multiplication, which is great. So this is indeed A inverse. And we obviously have to be careful. We should call it the left inverse of A because we're multiplying on the left. So here's a situation where the order very much matters unless there is another miraculous exception from non-commutativity. We'll investigate this later. Okay, so now that we've established that it's the proper inverse, we now know that this is identity, so in a product it actually completely goes away. So the vector of the unknowns equals A inverse B. So let's calculate what it equals, and I believe I have just enough space. And here, of course, I guess we're going to use the dot product perspective. In the first entry, we have minus 4, minus 20, that's minus 24, plus 25, 1. Great. In the second entry, we have minus 4, plus 55. All right, let's see. Minus 4, minus 4, plus 55. That's 51, plus, minus 50, 1. And in the last entry, we have 6 minus 15. 6, excuse me, minus 30. That's minus 24, plus 25, 1. So the answer is 1, 1, 1. We saw this before in the computer illustration of matrix algebra, but now we have full control over what's going on and we've established all the details of this calculation. So this is the concept of the inverse. It's as powerful as it is beautiful. It completes matrix algebra. There are no new elements of matrix algebra to tell you about. And in the next video, we'll address this very question of whether the left inverse is the right inverse or whether it's two different matrices. Of course, our expectation is that it's two different matrices. 
it would take quite a lot for this product carried out in the opposite order to equal identity as well. So let's see what happens.